Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope that you all managed to uh, stretch your legs, grab a drink uh, for the last hour of our uh, Heritage Kids final event. And for this last section, we're going to be looking in a bit more detail about what the future holds for this work, looking at persistent identifiers um, across heritage and within the Towards a National Collection programme. Starting off with me going through some of the project recommendations that we have. So I'm going to bring up my screen. And I'll start by looking at some of the recommendations that we had, the interim points of this project. So I think it was possibly about this time last year, actually, we put out some early findings from the work that we'd done in the first half of the project, and we had come up with nine recommendations. That set of nine recommendations was in two parts. There are this page of recommendations that I'm sharing with you now, which were essentially short term activities that could be begun uh, under the auspices of the Heritage Kids project. So we acknowledge the findings from the first survey about needing to address the benefits of persistent identifiers directly to decision makers within cultural heritage institutions. And so work with the developing identifiers tool, as well as the videos that we produced towards the end of last year, uh, helping to move us in that direction, as well as opening up the conversations that we need to have with decision makers. Um, as Francis has already demonstrated, the developing identifiers resource also directly addresses recommendation two, which is to help with the selection of appropriate identifiers based on what people's needs are. So describing those institutional requirements and what system identifiers might help us to meet some of those institutional requirements uh, and the practical steps that we can make to uh, moving towards them. We also had recommendation three, which is about starting to work with system suppliers to ensure that the systems we're using to manage our collections uh, digitally and uh, place any of that information online meets any of these PID based requirements that we're defining through uh, developing um, identifiers for heritage organisations. And again, we started to have those conversations, but it's something we need to continue to take forward. Now that we have a, a better description of what our requirements are, we need to actually have those conversations with more providers within the sector uh, to look at how they can support us all. There was a gathering of cost information, which, as I mentioned just before the break, has been the most difficult thing to move forward. And so uh, we need to continue that work, I think, is, is the main conclusion for recommendation four that this has not ended within this project. There has work that there is work out there from the Netherlands uh, and the work that UKRI have already done that we can learn from and look at their approaches and see if we can have a, a better cost description of what the cost of persistent identifiers look like uh, within the sector, as well as the um, financial and resource benefits of using persistent identifiers. Recommendation five was about guidance um, on citation practices, so that comes under the developing identifiers uh, work as well. Um, and then looking at sector-wise governance and policies around persistent identifiers, at least at least kicking that work off. Uh, and I think again, one of the things we wanted to do is put out the British Library persistent identifier policy as something that people could um, take some inspiration from and go ahead and look at what a persistent identifier policy for their own organisation might look like based on what we've done. Uh, we are open to people uh, wholesale kind of copying our approach and rebranding it and, and renaming it as their persistent identifier policy, although obviously it requires more than that. It actually requires conversations with uh, your technical infrastructure and architecture colleagues, um, with collections colleagues to, to understand what makes a reasonable uh, persistent identifier policy for your context. These are all things that we knew we could start off within the project, but we also had uh, three recommendations that we knew already went well beyond uh, the scope of what we could do within this project. Um, again, that is about getting those persistent identifier policies discussed and in place uh, at organisations. 
to support linking up of metadata if we can find shared approaches to do that um, if we can find complementary practices uh, that will help us link together our identifiers and therefore our collections going forward um, taken from the case study at the British Library as well as the National Gallery where we have core strategic systems that are rather um, monolithic and difficult to change um, we can actually look at the lightweight, lightweight software and middleware that can be used to implement persistent identifiers alongside those strategic systems. Um, and again, that is actually um, something mentioned um, in the earlier panel session about actually anything you can do to act locally still helps us with the bigger picture of connecting up collections. Um, and so anything you can implement locally around persistent identification within your metadata and of your collections will help the bigger picture going forward. And then our final recommendation from that interim work was actually the programme itself in collaboration with the IROs um, and uh, across the wider sector, so not just heritage organisations, luckily, lucky enough, uh, to be an IRO, um, but we need to look at sector-wide approaches to this. And I think that actually what we have been able to do within the last year of the project is really um, open up what Recommendation 9 really means and the kinds of discussions that we now need to have going forward. But what we do know is that recommendations around cost analysis, um, picking up what we are kind of uh, extolling to the programme and moving that forward, implementation of policies and middleware solutions. All of these are recommendations that can continue going forward. Um, although our project is ending at the end of this month, all of what we have produced is still there. I am still around, uh, the British Library and other partners on the project who have now some experience and broader knowledge of the the requirements and the issues are still around to help join in with those conversations if you like um, we're not just going to suddenly uh, disappear into a black hole uh, and so i would certainly encourage folks to come and speak to me um, for any questions or work that we need to carry forward in terms of expanding recommendation nine it feels like there are three key parts um, for moving forward the first is that when we started this project, we thought there might be a way to recommend a relatively limited set of persistent identifiers that people could go away and get started on. And actually, we should recommend this minimal set to the sector. And I think what we're saying is now that that won't work <laughs> from what we've learned. Um, we need a sector wide approach, but it can't be overly prescriptive on what people definitely should or shouldn't use. But actually, there are common principles that we should build towards. And if we are using tools, services and identifiers that are built on these common principles about, um, I guess, robustness, trust about whether they are fit for purpose, those are the key principles that we should assess anything against um, when we decide to use them. Again, that's an approach we've kind of taken within our persistent identifier policy for the British Library as well. We say these are the key features of an identifier system that we want to use. And anything that meets those um, uh, key features, if you like, are what we should move towards. Um, and again, that's in the policy that Francis, uh, I think we shared the link for earlier. Um, and we can elaborate in more detail in the final report when that comes out from the project that actually this guidance that we've produced should be used as a common starting point for the sector to enable a kind of a common understanding and a common grounding in what we are uh, discussing when we talk about identifiers. And that that should, that common starting point then is a pathway to community adoption. Um, and all of the, the, the toolkit, if you like, that we've tried to produce throughout the project we do need to look at how we can uh, maintain, update and adapt that as we all move together as a community as well. Um, that's one of the reasons we chose to put it on GitHub so that anyone can um, fork it and adapt it and reuse the content uh, for their own context. 
we will again you know i will be trying to make sure that we uh, keep things updated and maintained and therefore kind of welcome community contributions to that resource as a community effort and would welcome um any uh, comments or emails from anyone uh, who'd be interested in working with us uh, at the British Library on that resource as well. So those are the kinds of discussions that we've had and I think are the types of recommendations that are echoed from what we heard from the partners earlier in the session. Uh, and this is the point now where I bring in my panel, um, which is going to be helpfully chaired by um, Lorna Hughes. I'm just going to stop sharing. Hello, Lorna. Um, to think about some of these recommendations um, and next steps for the community and for the programme going forward. Um, Lorna is going to chair this for me, uh, but is also going to be kind of giving a bit of a response to kick us off. So shall I hand over to you, Lorna? Yes, please. Thanks very much, Rachel. It's very nice to be here. It's very nice to um, see all of the results of the project and to hear the recommendations. And I think it's also especially helpful to see how the recommendations fit into the practice that we've heard about uh, coming out of such a disparate range of organisations and stakeholder communities um, across the cultural heritage and research landscape. So um, I always find that whatever, you know, whenever I see these recommendations coming out of a very formal process of research and collaboration engagement, that it's always very gratifying to have one's uh, perceptions and indeed prejudices <laughs> confirmed. Um, so I was very pleased to see the focus on um, linking collections, which I think, you know, is now very clear that there is a, a great advantage to using persistent identifiers across uh, the research infrastructure landscape and in terms of linking collections. It seems to me that the case is very well made for the value and benefit of linking collections and using persistent identifiers in this space. Um, so I was really pleased as well to see some of my prejudices confirmed, um, especially around the infrastructural requirements, around the training aspects, um, around the cost of implementation, um, and also the, the challenges that the, this raises in organisations where we do see staff attrition and pressure of work and um, the, the sort of constant need to do 25 things at once. Um, adding something new into the mix um, is always challenging. So I was very gratified to see the emphasis on the, not just the value proposition of uh, persistent identifiers, but ways that we can practically and concretely bring in decision makers into um, the implementation space. Um, and again, that emphasis on policies and linking policy to practice, which I think is going to be really key moving forward in this space. Um, so I'm very glad to see the emphasis on collections, emphasis on interoperability and connecting collections, but also an emphasis, emphasis on people, um, people, structures, organisations and the implementation space. Um, so um, I probably um, have the least uh, technical expertise in this space, um, but as somebody who has worked on linking collections and creating uh, sort of research uh, collaborations and research infrastructure development that does link collections, um, I'm very glad to see these, these recommendations and I really like the way that they've been framed and I think there's a lot of promise here for the ways that they can be taken forward. Um, so. I think I would like to just move on now and introduce um, the panel who have been here and you have heard from them um, in various capacities throughout the course of the um, of the seminar. Um, uh, of, uh, Rebecca Bailey, the Programme Director of Towards a National Collection, uh, Kevin Gosling from Collections Trust and uh, Richard Light, um, really glad to see you all here. Um, always very relieved to see the whole panel here, especially at the end of a session like this. So, uh, so it's good to, good to have you all here. Um, I think the final sequence um, 
in which people are speaking is Richard, then Kevin, then Rebecca. Is that correct? Um, I think that's that's how I understood it. There was a wee bit back and forth about that. Um, Thanks, right, Lorna. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just, if it's OK with you, Rachel, um, just hand over to the speakers. And then I believe you have a couple of prompts as well for a discussion, um, Rachel, that you might jump in with at various points. The other thing I'm going to do um, as I'm listening to the speakers is to um, monitor the chat. So if you do have questions, uh, we will have time for a discussion at the end, but um, if you have a question, it would be really helpful if you could post it in the chat um, and I will I will pick that up and make sure that your your question has um, is noted. Um, so without further ado, I will hand just, over. Sorry, Lorna, I'm just going to jump because what I neglected to do was properly introduce you and your vested interest uh, in this <laughs> in the program going forward. So we should probably mention that you are uh, a PI on the discovery projects within the program going forward. Um, so I don't know if you want to add any more of that before moving on to Richard. Oh, uh, just my uh, thank you, Rachel. Yes, it's, it's not about me. Uh, but yes, I am. Um, I'm a principal investigator on one of the tank discovery projects, um, Our Heritage, Our Stories, which is about linking community generated digital collections uh, based in mostly archives, but other heritage organisations around the UK. So we will be coming back to persistent identifiers a lot in our own work. Um, so I'm very happy to see the uh, output and recommendations here. Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, so great, I'll hand over to Richard now. And uh, Rachel, is it everybody has about 10 minutes maximum, is that correct? Um, yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make people stop talking at 10 minutes, but I, I suspect they may not need that long, um, just to make sure that we've got time for questions and um, your prompts for a discussion if you want to, to do those. Great, thanks. On you go, Richard. Okay, thanks, Lorna. I, I shall attempt to be considerably less than 10 minutes. Um, well, I, I just wanted to sort of share my experience of trying to actually implement persistent identifier frameworks from the perspective of collections management software. So. I've been involved with the, the mode software for a long time and as a sort of interest project, I thought I'd see if what was needed to actually make it work um, with linked data. Um, and um, I actually managed to make it do the job. So effectively we have um, the five star linked data rules all, all being followed by, by this software. Um, it, does all of the things the other speakers have mentioned. So um, delivering an actual result when you put the identifier, the URL in to your browser. So human readable data is a minimum, but um, then machine processable data. So in RDF or JSON or micro data, some format that a machine process can actually read as probably an alternative representation of that data. So I got all of that working, but the, I think the, the challenge that I have found is that um, the users of modes have not actually rushed to take this up. So um, we have lots and lots of, of modes users, but this linked data framework is actually only in use in a handful of those institutions. And um, I think the the reasons for this need to be looked at because um, in a way it's an exercise I think in trust um, because if you publish your data then that's an exercise in, in putting your data out there. Not all museums are actually that keen to do that um, so I think there are issues around that but also there, there are lots of possibilities with linked data to actually use other people's resources. So for example, you can have an authority like GeoNames. And if you put GeoNames identifiers into your data, um, then you actually get coordinates, you get latitude, longitude information about those places for free from resolving that identifier and picking up the data that's behind it. So there, there are lots of 
possibilities that you, you could be taking advantage of, but it does require you to actually trust that external provider of PIDs to continue to be there and for their data to continue to be useful to you. Um, I think one very useful point Joe made was about standards. Again, if we're going towards a system where lots of individual museums are using a facility in their collections management system to deliver linked data, then that means you've got lots and lots of sources that the data is coming from. And unless those sources are delivering results which are structurally similar to each other, then someone wanting to aggregate that data is going to be faced with an impossible um, maelstrom of incompatible data coming from these sources. So I think there is definitely a challenge there to identify and implement standards for the, the metadata that, that's um, going to be delivered from a linked data resource so that there's a compatibility across the sector. So effectively we can have two possible strategies. We can have a distributed strategy where everybody does their own thing linked data wise and you then do a standard web spidering exercise to go out and find all of the mentions of museum data and bring it back together. Or you have a centralized culture grid type um, framework where it's all brought into the center. So the advantage of individual museums doing this is that it can happen at source and can be a, a dynamic part of the cataloging process. So every time you press save on a record, that record is instantly available as linked data to the rest of the world. Um, if you have a centralized resource, then you've got a sort of latency built in that that data has to be in some way transformed and pushed across into the central resource. So just thinking forward as to where we might be going, there are trade-offs in, in those two rather different approaches, although potentially they, they could be complementary. Um, I think one thing that occurred to me while we've been having this webinar is that one of the bigger challenges that small museums like modes users face is that sort of getting the data out to the web bit. Um, so the, the more advanced users have actually registered their own domain name for their museum. And obviously if you've got a registered domain name, then you've got the means of producing a unique identifier for each object, because you can stick your domain on the front of it and then your unique database identifier on the end, and that's guaranteed to be unique across the whole web. But uh, as has been mentioned, um, even within individual museums, you can have lots of 1980.2.1 identifiers. So you do need some means of, of disambiguating across the whole piece. Now, it could be that if there was a central service that actually did that job of resolving identifiers and linking through to the museum database, that, that could be a genuinely useful thing to provide centrally to complement individual museums actually just having the, the basic functionality to push their data out to the, as it were, the margins of their system, but then for that to be picked up and actually pushed across to the rest of the world. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks very much, Richard. Lots to think about there and, and lots of questions coming in um, on the side that I'll, I'll pick up um, after we've heard from all the, the panellists. So I'm going to hand over to Kevin now. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Lorna. And thank you, Richard, for, for queuing me up nicely because the, uh, the, the bit of the puzzle that, that we at Collections Trust are particularly interested in is the getting those records to to the web to, to getting them to be available online particularly from not just small museums but um, you know in many cases even quite large civic services are struggling with, with that particular bit of the problem so um, what we have been doing for a few years now is really trying to think about the kinds of help that we could give to museums um, to replace something that Richard's already mentioned, Culture Grid, which was a, a kind of demonstrator aggregator for museum records, which 
um, stopped being funded in 2015. Um, and we've been sort of thinking long and hard about some of the reasons for that and, and what we might need to do to overcome those. And with the help of the Open Data Institute, uh, about this time last year, we um, really took a fresh look at the kind of data institution that might be useful to museums, large and small. And I'm just going to put a link in the chat because we've we published what we call the framework for change, um, which has um, at its heart a kind of museum data service, which isn't really trying to do any kind of particularly clever processing and standardizing of data into any particular schema, but it's simply um, making it really easy for museums to make a copy of their um, existing records available in a data lake with some metadata around it, um, and then to make that data available to anyone who wants to use it for any purpose um, by being able to sort of search and, and select relevant records. And we've made common cause in this with Art UK, who, who need something like this for their own operational needs. And we've also been talking to the University of, of Leicester about this and you know there are reasons to be cheerful about the progress that we're making so I think this is very timely because one of the things that we can we think we can do with this service is to actually mint PIDs um, for all the records that come in so you know our approach to encouraging museums uh, large and small to adopt PIDs for their collection records would simply be to just make it happen for them so they didn't really have to think about it um, at all. It would just happen as part of um, submitting your data to the museum data service. So we're, we're sort of starting to roll our sleeves up and get into the detailed planning. Uh, and, you know, it would be, be great to kind of draw from the learnings of, of this project and, and various other kind of towards a national collection projects as well, uh, as we kind of come to to really refine the thinking and, and make the detailed plans for how all this might happen. And I should say that um, not only do we aspire to, to, to potentially have you know, all object records from all museums eventually within this data lake, but also to provide a home for enhancements and content created that links back to those records. Um, and if I could uh, just give a little plug for another tank project that uh, we were involved with, which was one of the uh, COVID urgency projects. And it was led by the University of York. And I'll, I'll put the link to the final report in there. The project was called Making It Fair. And that was a pun on, well, firstly, how do we kind of make some of the benefits of big initiatives like towards a national collection and some of the, the kind of more advanced techniques being pioneered. How do we make those available to smaller museums? But also how can we um, make content which is often at the moment single use like blog posts, exhibition text, um, you know, community generated content, that kind of thing. How can we turn that into fair data? And so one of the things that we, we think this museum data service could do could be to um, provide a, a long-term home with persistent identifiers to this kind of content that is being routinely created by museums and the museum data service would form um, the, the kind of basis of a, a whole ecosystem of tools such as headless content management systems that would allow content to be easily captured and saved really as part of existing workflows. So without anybody having to do anything more than they're already doing. So, you know, please do have a look at, um, at that Making It Fair project and our Open Data Institute uh, framework, um, because we think in large part, these things could uh, together go a long way towards solving some of the problems raised by the, the research uh, for this project, at least for the museum sector.
Thanks very much, Kevin. Lots to pick up there, um, as I'm sure there will be quite a lot of questions around the idea of the museum data service and um, the idea of uh, sort of automating some of the technology. There's been quite a lot of questions um, in the chat about the fact picking up on the discussion um, about standards and noting that the sort of technology isn't really the standards aren't really keeping up with the technological opportunities um, and that's something that I, I think we can maybe pick up in the, the broader discussion about the emerging service that you're involved in so thanks very much for that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Rebecca from the, uh, the tank perspective. Thanks Rebecca. Thank you very much, Lorna, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'd probably start off just bringing us sort of back up to what Towards a National Collection is for and what it comprises. Um, we're all about breaking down the barriers between collections, finding ways to connect data, but very specifically, um, delivering what people want. And we are doing a piece of research at the moment about what people want, if you've been part of that, thank you very much. Um, so it's about enabling collections to be used for research. It's about enhancing the ability for public engagement and underpinning it all, of course, is the kind of standards and technical work um, that we've been hearing about today. Um, and you'll be aware that um, the PIDS project is one of eight foundation projects. You've heard about some of the others as well today. Um, and Making It Fair that Kevin talked about is uh, one of three COVID-19 projects. And Lorna is leading one of five large-scale discovery projects that started um, before Christmas and are running for the next three years. But in addition to that grant funding, we're also commissioning pieces of research. Um, so we're, as I say, we're out there with the audience agency asking people what they want from data in the future and how they want to access it. Um, Kevin is leading a piece of work, uh, figuring out, and don't give any secrets away, Kevin, no, no results today, on um, how many digital collections there are out there, how many digital assets are out there, what could form um, the national collection in future. And the reason, apologies, I say for Kevin not to give any secrets, is he's revealing all to our steering committee on Thursday and they get here at first, So, but the report will follow. Um, and we've also been commissioning research on copyright and open access, absolutely fascinating. Please come to the future webinars on that. We've been doing some international benchmarking, looking at what other countries do. So it's trying to sort of position the PIDS project within this much um, uh, wider frame of different research that's being undertaken. And um, my job, supported by a very able scoping group and a very powerful steering committee, is to try and make sense of what all these projects report and the recommendations they make. One of the tactical decisions we took um, was that researchers, tactical and completely appropriate decisions, was that researchers should be able to make independent recommendations. So they shouldn't be writing drafts that I then go, I uh -uh, don't want to hear that, don't want that. So every researcher that's commissioned or grant funded should be making the recommendations they believe the sector should follow. I then have the difficult job of working out from those which ones um, we might be able to take forward. The time scale for this is, is um, it's kind of good and kind of bad. It's quite long. So bringing together the recommendations from all of the projects, they'll come together into a policy recommendation document, but not until early 2024. And those that set of policy recommendations will be used to inform a bid for substantial funding from UKRI for a national collections research infrastructure. So in terms of the things that are coming out today, and it was really helpful to hear from Rachel, which ones will be completed by the end of the project, which ones carry on and which are to the future, um, we need to be mindful of that timetable. But I think the 
the advantage for PIDs is the discovery projects, because I don't think there's a single discovery project who did not reference the PIDs project within their proposal because it's such a fundamental um, building block. So the discovery projects are going to give us a real kind of test bed of how to implement some of this work so it'll stay very live. Um, it was also hugely welcome to me to hear that Rachel, the British Library, the other co-eyes are very happy to remain as um, the go-to people on this subject and that they can, you know, take questions, give advice. The British Library can throw itself a bit behind ensuring this work stays live. So I hope between the continuation of that expertise and the delivery within the discovery projects, we're in a really good place with PIDs. One of the other things, of course, that I'm looking at is common themes across projects. So not just detailed recommendations on how PIDs could be delivered, but the sort of topic we were talking about earlier, skills. So it's all very well making recommendations, but if there's nobody to deliver them, to develop them, to sustain them, then we're getting nowhere. So it's really interesting to me to hear from all of the projects and the commissions, the perspective on skills and how I can work with the HRC to try and influence how they might support skills development uh, in the future and particularly how we might need to put skills at the centre of a future infrastructure. So when we say infrastructure, this is not just a technical platform. This could actually be a centre of excellence for this kind of work where we have teams of specialists um, developing, sharing their skills, providing the kind of training that was mentioned earlier in an ideal world, contributing to career progression and the sort of identity of, of um, digital humanities scholars meeting um, computer scientists and, you know, breeding a whole new uh, generation who know a hell of a lot more about this stuff than me and many of my generation. Um, so skills is one thing I'm looking at across all of the projects. Another, of course, is standards and the clearer and more straightforward your recommendations on that are, the easier it will be me, easier it will be for me to pick them up, put them in the recommendations. So clarity, good on that. And also something that's coming through through pretty strongly and has come through through all the communication I get about what we should be doing is about the support of smaller organisations. So always bearing in mind the, the demographics of the sector and that we're not designing things just for big IROs. This is about the whole state of the sector. Um, and we're very specifically doing that uh, within the digital audit. Kevin's just about to do some uh, some consultation to get a picture of the capacity of smaller organisations. Hopefully that'll come through the audience research too, but it's really helpful to come through your project recommendations. I know it was, it's listed in there, but if you've got anything specific to say to that, um, and obviously the Making It Fair project has been particularly focused on that. Um, so I'd have to say really that the PIDS project has been hugely influential to the whole programme. There's never been any doubt in any applicant for any kind of funding that PIDs are not central to this process. So I would say congratulations, you really, you, you've, you've been influential, you've been, you've picked the right topic and you've definitely been sharing it in the right way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of give that kind of picture of where it feeds in, how it links links across the different um, pieces of research to give you some hope that there is a future, but that it's quite long term and it's great that the PIDs work can stay live while we move towards that potential infrastructure funding. I think that's me, Lorna. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That's great. And yes, I think you're absolutely right. There's not, as far as I'm aware, anything going on across the towards the national collection uh, project space that isn't very aware of the need for um, persistent identifiers and and has been re has not referenced uh, the work coming out of this project. So it's uh, good to to hear that. Um, I can turn over, I think we've got a few minutes before the end for questions. Um, I mean, I'm just going through the, um, I'm just going through the, uh, the, the comments in the chat, which um, 
are mostly um, in the form of comments rather than questions, uh, which is great. But there, one of the things that I did want to pick up on was um, there was a comment um, about, and I think this picks up Rebecca's comment on the sort of the digital humanity space. Um, a comment about communities like archaeology and uh, natural history where there there is a degree of consensus there is a degree of community support i mean i guess i would just ask the panel how they think that this sort of engagement with communities of practice um could be uh, you know could be part of taking this space forward and and support and uh, being a how can communities of practice that exist in various disciplines and various fields of interest be a bridge to the kind of uh, good practice we've been hearing about i don't know if any of the panelists have any comments on that um, well i think it's about developing shared frameworks because <clears throat> obviously you know, the, the two dimensions of this challenge are the individual institution and getting it to bookmark its own stuff, which is sort of where I started with what I was talking about. But then to actually get a shared view across the community, people need to be using the same persistent identifier to mean the same concept in their data. And so the, the, the two challenges there are, first of all, inventing that shared identifier and having a framework within which it sits. And then the second challenge is making it straightforward for individuals to get that data into their records. Um, so I think then it's the first of those that I think that you're, you're raising as a question here. How do we actually create those resources in, in the first place? Um, now, obviously, we've got some resources around. We've got the, the work that Getty has done in the field of artist names, um, the Ars and Architecture Thesaurus and the Thesaurus of Geographic Names. Um, so we, we have some shared resources we could be using as a community, but if we want to develop something new, then th there has to be a shared need of some sort that, that can be leveraged to actually get people to work together. I mean, one thing I've argued for for well, decades, literally, um, is the sort of shared, what I call a simple name authority. So by simple name, I would mean the sort of class of objects, or if you like, the everyday English word you use to describe a certain type of object. Because if we could get that information in a shared format across all collections, then it would become possible to actually look at distribution of all sorts of material in ways that we just cannot begin to do at the moment. So it's, it's very simple data, it's stuff that everyone records about every object, but at the moment they just use whatever word comes into their head, or if we're lucky, they'll be consistent within their institution, but there's no consistency nationwide. So I, I think that there's a, a potential massive benefit of creating that sort of shared simple name authority uh, and also it could be a window into our world for everyone outside it because as well as just having words we could actually have descriptions and a sort of richer text about that type of object um, that would actually be of freestanding value in its own right and potentially that could be a, a community authoring project so we could start with something like the famous Hertfordshire simple word list and extend it a lot Thanks. Does anybody other, anyone else want to pick up on that, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, just just picking up on you know, the sort of communities of practice. I noticed that there's a bit of um, to and fro in the chat about um, GBIF and natural history data, and actually that exemplifies the problem that I, uh, we're focusing on very well because the natural history collections, you know, GBIF is a well-established, you know, international well-resourced infrastructure you know there are plenty of standards there's the darwin core metadata standard there are sort of taxonomic conventions and yet only a handful of uk museums actually have contributed their data to to gbif because it's a bit tricky to do it and there's not much benefit to the museum so if you were to take 
a museum service that's multidisciplinary, like say Leicester or a sort of slightly smaller scale, somewhere like Saffron Walden, the kind of approach that, that we think will bear fruit is by teaming up with somebody like Art UK, which is for other reasons, talking to those institutions and getting art records from them. At the same time, we can get the natural history records almost as a byproduct. We can put them in the data lake and then the, the likes of Natska and the Natural History Museum could then form projects to, to work with that raw data to turn it into and transform it into Darwin Core and upload it to GBIF, where it then becomes accessible to the world's scientists. So they, they sort of say that, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. It's the first single step of getting data out of um, siloed databases into a data lake that is the difficult bit. Once we've done that and apply persistent identifiers, then all things suddenly become much easier. So that's that's really the approach that we're trying to develop. Thanks. I mean, if I could pick up on that, I, I wrote something down earlier, which is, you know, sort of the message that seems to be coming out of a lot of this is act locally, but think globally. And it's all about these sort of small implementations that can happen at a local level and at least and at a data level. Um, but I was seeing in the chat some discussion with J um, from Jane around the archives hub and the sort of need to get people to thinking in a datafication world, you know, thinking about, about collections as data and thinking about how things can be visualized and shared and linked um, as, a, as a bigger picture, the sort of uh, think globally and think about collections as, as data globally, but, but what are the, the short term uh, step by step uh, changes that can be made, um, especially at small and medium uh, heritage organizations. So there's a comment there from Josie about the uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, which is looking at this at the moment, which again is another, another source of organizations, another community of practice. There is one specific question I've just seen in the Q&A, uh, Rupert, um, I don't know if you want to ask the question, Rupert, or if you want happy for me to ask it on your behalf. Um, Rupert, if you are still there, feel free. I don't think we can unmute participants. All oh, right, sorry, Rachel. No, yeah, sorry. Um, so the question uh, was for Richard. Why do you think so few organisations have taken advantage of the linked data delivery mechanisms and modes? Right. Well, I think partly because it hasn't actually been pushed very hard. It's not seen as a, a sort of core part of the the product I and mean, most people use modes essentially to catalogue their collections. Um, a, a minority of them then use them to get those collections online, but they, they see a sort of website with a collection search facility as, as the limit of their ambitions and then say, right, job done and go off to the, the rest of the job of um, managing the museum. So apart from the words with trust, the other ones which have tended to adopt linked data is for a situation where we have an external website developer who's um, setting up a site for the museum but um, not within their own um, network. So we then provide a linked data interface out to the website developer so they can actually access the data live and then deliver a collection search facility externally to, to the museum's own framework. But I think un unless the museum has actually geared itself up to this um, quite difficult job of actually getting a website and collection search facility going, then it, it probably wouldn't even think about doing the linked data thing. I mean, I would like to turn that on its head and have the linked data thing is the really easy thing to do just by setting a few settings in, a, in your sort of mode control panel and then having it magically work. Um, and, and I think, you know, there are advantages of taking that approach in that all of the modes users are actually using the same data structure. Um, and so the, there's a lot of structural compatibility uh, amongst the data in those distributed museums. So in terms of standardization of 
the linked data we could actually de deliver, um, then Mode is actually in a very strong position to, to help with that. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. And thanks for the question. We're, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel, um, who's going to close with a little exercise where we, uh, we are asked about the, the recommendations. But I just want to thank the panelists, Kevin, Richard and Rebecca so much. And thank you all for your questions and comments in the chat, which have been really, really insightful and interesting. So Rachel, over to you. Absolutely. And thank you, Lorna, for chairing that session. Um, I think we're going to download a copy of the chat. And if there's any other questions or anything uh, that we might want to add to the notes or materials uh, from this, including lots of the links that folks have shared throughout the day, uh, we will do that. I am going to go back to uh, sharing my screen for the Mentimeter. So if you have uh, closed it and would like to uh, reopen it, or if you've still got it there on your smartphone, we have got three questions for you. Uh, the first one is, in your opinion of the recommendations that I have shown so far, and again, as I mentioned, these are just in draft, and I think discussions today will have helped us to kind of frame some of those recommendations and pull out a bit more of the detail that people are interested in when it comes to finally reporting on them. Um, but as we have them at the moment, uh, what is the most important recommendation for, for the sector as you see it. So I'm going to have a question after this, which is what would you uh, highlight as an important recommendation for the program? But this is thinking more widely than that. And this is thinking about the heritage sector as a whole, in terms of the recommendations that we've got specific to PIDs. What would you say is uh, your high priority item? We have got um, one person responding so far. As a reminder, if you did close it earlier, go to www.menti.com and pop in the code 73811998. Um, someone commenting um, that they would like the Mentimeter code in the chat. And that is a very good point. And I will type it in there for you. Now, Francis has already done it. Thank you, Francis. So we'll just give it a bit longer for people to prioritize our recommendations as we have them so far. Again, by the time we get to uh, now, the uh, final report, they might be slightly reworded and have uh, different emphasis uh, based on the feedback and some of the discussions that we've had today. So uh, don't be surprised if they're a little bit amended when you finally see our final reports. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And again, similar exercise, but what would you highlight and emphasize to the towards the national collection program? They might be exactly the same, or you might have a, a slightly different uh, emphasis for the program. I'm sure Rebecca is uh, excusing herself uh, from this exercise, <laughs> not wanting to influence it, but also we can't tell who's answered what, so it wouldn't matter anyway. <laughs> so. We've got organisational policies coming out uh, quite highly this time. Oh, just overtaken by not having too prescriptive uh, a sector wide approach. I think it's interesting that there are various calls on the having a, a very prescriptive versus not having a very prescriptive approach to persistent identifiers in that you will have discussions where it feels like we need to agree and settle on a smaller number of persistent identifiers and then you have a conversation with the same set of people the following week who uh, have good reasons for not having a, a, a small set of persistent identifiers. I think it's going to be a difficult one um, but actually settling on 
a good set of principles uh, is probably the, the best way to get us there. Okay, all right. I'm um, going to move on to the last question now, which is basically your opportunity to tell us what might be missing. Um, and I mean that in terms of what would you like to see in our recommendations that you haven't? Uh, what discussions do you think we haven't spent uh, enough time on up to this point? Uh, there are things that we know are missing, especially in terms of you know the detailed cost analysis, etc. And if you want to repeat that and emphasize that here, please do. Um, any other comments that you'd like to make? This is your opportunity to tell us anything that you are desperate to tell us as well. While I'm waiting for those to come through, I will uh, do our wrap up because we are just a little bit over time. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today, both uh, participants, panelists, um, and everyone adding questions, contributing to the discussion. Uh, I think this has been really helpful in terms of giving us the first chance to talk about our recommendations, get them out there, and again, give us a bit of uh, context and making sure that we frame them in a way that, that works for the sector and for the community um, of IROs, but also for the programme. Um, it has been a really interesting two years having these conversations, looking at all the paths that we could go down uh, in terms of materials we can produce. I hope that people have found it uh, useful and will continue to find it useful. As I said, um, any opportunities you have for us to, or for, for me specifically to come and talk about this identifiers, I am willing to take them up. Um, and finally, I just want to thank uh, Frances Madden, who has uh, joined us today. She was a research associate, but has actually already moved on to her uh, new role, but we've managed to steal back some time to actually help us run this event and to get everything finalized today. So yes, thank you very much. I'm going to leave up this mentee running for any comments people still want to make, um, but otherwise I'm going to uh, bring the session to a close. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.